Then there will exist electrons corresponding to the shaded region which will be unstable to whistler mode wave growth and which will precipitate via strong pitch angle diffusion. Further, electrons at the same latitude as the enhanced flux tube will drift in longitude into this flux tube and be precipitated also. Assuming that the electron precipitation is constant along the width of the duct, we obtain for the electron precipitation into the ionosphere JP, as given by equation 1 as shown. I now wish to consider the electron precipitation into the ionosphere. This causes the, the electron enhanced electron precipitation causes ionospheric enhancement in the lower E region in general. The continuity equation for ionospheric plasma is shown where QU and QP are the ion pair production rates due to photoionization and electron precipitation <coughs> respectively. Because there are very few negative ions in the lower E and upper D regions, we may neglect the linear recombination term as we may do also the diffusion term. Consider a small change in QP of delta QP causing a resultant change in Ni of delta Ni. Then to first order we obtain equation 2 where we have assumed that the system remains near equilibrium during the change. Using typical lower E region parameters we obtained equation 3 which relates the plasmospheric plasma density enhancement to, oh, sorry there, to the ionospheric enhancement. The ionospheric enhancement will develop an electrostatic polarization field and the theory of this has been dealt with by many authors including Cole 1960 and Bostrom 1964. And bipolar diffusion causes an, causes an electrostatic polarization field due to the different mobilities of the electrons and ions. It is further caused by winds blowing through the enhancement and the discontinuity in ionospheric plasma density and conductivity. Due to the fact that electric currents will flow up along the geomagnetic field lines into the high conductivity parts of the E and F regions, the electrostatic polarization field will be short circuited. Uh, this causes the jump in the electrostatic polarization field at the boundary of the enhancement to be determined by the ratio of the height integrated Pedersen and Hall conductivities. The maximum polarization field that may be developed with an ionospheric enhancement is given approximately by this equation here, which in first order reduces to equation 4, where sigma p and sigma h are the height integrated Pedersen and Hall conductivities respectively, and u is the ionospheric wind velocity at the height of the enhancement. Using typical parameters, we obtained equation 5. The direction of the electrostatic polarization field is determined by the shape and size of the enhancement, but mainly by the wind direction. In the following, we assume that the, west, that the electrostatic polarization field will in general be westward in order that the mechanism work. I now wish to consider plasmosphere-ionosphere coupling. Due to the high conductivity along the geomagnetic field lines, the electrostatic polarization field will be mapped almost unattenuated up into the plasmosphere. Assuming a westward electrostatic polarization field and using the Shaw and hydromagnetic relation, we obtain equation 6, which gives the cross L motion of the duct. Now, the volume of a flux tube is approximately proportional to L to the 4. Hence, its plasma density will vary as L to the negative 4. Now, the plasmospheric plasma density varies approximately as L to the negative 3. Hence, we obtained equation 7, and thus equation 8, which we differentiate equation 7, and equation 8 gives the growth rate of the duct, or enhanced flux tube. And as shown, initially, the enhanced flux tube will grow with an e-folding time of about 2.5 seconds. We then assumed that the uh, feedback mechanism would continue to work and as the ionospheric enhancement built up and as nonlinear effects became important. 
Growth rates for relatively large enhancements were calculated by a simple nonlinear theory, and this enables to reach the following conclusions. Initially, a Whistler duct will be created just within the plasmosphere, round about L equals 4 in general, where the gain of the system is highest and where there is a higher probability of obtaining a stray electric field or a plasmospheric plasma density enhancement. Uh, the, the enhanced flux tube will then move in to form a duct of about 10% in three quarters of an hour. This is approximate, and in, in this time it will move in from an L value of about 4, say it was created there, to an L value of about 3.5, where the electron precipitation energy is much higher, about 70 keV, and thus the ionospheric enhancement will be in the upper D region, where electrostatic polarization fields are severely attenuated in mapping up into the plasmosphere. Thus, we may say that an approximate limit of about 10% is implied upon with the duct enhancements by this mechanism. The growth rates shown here are slightly overestimated by the fact that we have used the maximum electrostatic polarization field that can be produced and by the fact that the ionosphere takes a finite time to reach equilibrium. In conclusion, uh, this mechanism predicts cross L Whistler duct motion of the order of 0.5 Re per hour during formation, electron precipitation of the order of 5 times 10 to the 10 electrons per meter squared per second, Whistler duct longitudinal dimension of the order of about 500 kilometer, uh, creation around dusk, latitudinal distribution peaked with it just within the plas plasma pores, uh, slow decay and L a number towards, L, towards lower L values and a sharp cutoff above the plasma pores as is observed and uh, associated ionospheric phenomena in the form of low altitude sporadic E and possibly uh, field align F region irregularities caused by the electric field in the ionosphere in the, in the E region. Um, thus, well, this theory uh, has been developed by a simple calculation so far. We intend to do a, a better and more advanced computer simulation in future and hopefully this will lead to a much better understanding of Whistler ducts and of Whistler mode propagation in the plasmosphere. Thank you. Okay, this uh, Whistler duct motion that you uh, predict is very fast and would be interpreted by people looking on the ground as an electric field, uh, a westward electric field, would it not? That's right. Uh, and uh, I don't believe that in general that uh, the Whistler ducts move that rapidly. Uh, could I say that, um, okay, uh, this is just during their formation and like in general you're observing uh, fully developed with the ducts and um, the growth rates we have used are I, I think that they are overestimated and 0.5 RE per hour would, would be an upper estimate I, I think from the values that we obtained that it would probably be about 0.1 RE per hour to 0.5 RE per hour something in that range but I, I make, make the point that it is only during its formation that, that we're predicting that sort of with the duct motion and it depends on whether the electrostatic polarization field is exactly westward and that sort of thing and various assumptions that we made in that theory. Uh, is this a nighttime process in general or does this happen day and night, the uh, formula you're uh, discussing? Well, I think it, it will just happen during... It, it could very unlikely happen at, at daytime, but it's due to the fact it's more li most likely to happen at night. Um, because you get a larger ionospheric enhancement and thus a larger electrostatic polarization field. And from the th when one looks closely at the theory, one finds that one gets larger gains around dawn, just after, sorry, just after dusk. And we expect that they will probably be created around dusk. As has been pointed out by Sagrada and Bolo uh, fairly recently, they found that with the ducks would tend to be created around, around dusk 
in association with substorms, which I think agrees with this theory because th this Whistler Duck mechanism will probably be associated with substorms. You're, you're are, also, you're predicting that there will be particle enhancements uh, south of the auroral zone or equator of the auroral zone to produce these things. Uh, no, this mechanism is entirely inside the plasma sphere. Um, no, but there will be particle precipitation. That's right. Enhanced e layer. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can enhance. That's a prediction of the theory. That's right. During the formation, there will be enhanced electron precipitation of the order of five times ten to the ten electrons per meter squared per second. For, yeah, I'm using MKS units as. Uh, as you should. As you should. Uh, you are well, speaking of uh, enhanced uh, precipitation of electrons when uh, you see these ducts. Has this been observed? Uh, oh, sorry. Are you referring to the abstract that I? Um, Would you repeat the question? Yes, you are speaking on the, your point two of electron pre precipitation accompanying Whistler ducts has been actually been observed. Uh, well, not really. Um, the point is that Halliwell and the, the, there, are quite, there are quite a few authors that have found enhanced electron precipitation associated with Whistler mode waves. Now, these are probably associated with. VLF and VLF discrete emissions and, and Whistler events inside the, a fully developed duct. Um, I note in the abstract that I, I said, as has been observed, electron precipitation. Well, uh, that is, I, I shouldn't really have put that. It, we wrote that about four months ago. Um, <laughs> but, but, but the point is that some of these people may have observed this electron precipitation during their formation, perhaps in those events. Because we would expect electron precipitation accompanying whistler mode waves in, in, the, in this case. But the events that have been reported and published are, well, they are probably associated with uh, wh whistler waves. But nobody has shown, to my knowledge, that uh, a satisfactory theory that, that can account for this observed electron precipitation just from one whistler wave propagating through a whistler duct. Uh, that is yet to be done. Uh, because uh, when uh, waves and electrons, energetic electrons, are in equilibrium, the cold plasma density should not change anything to the precipitation. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. I have a language difficulty with that. Would you try, try that one again? Uh, when energetic electrons and waves are in equilibrium, if you change the cold plasma density, the precipitation of, of energetic electrons should not change. Um, like, w oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure really how, how, how that sort of applies here. Um, I think she may be right. I'm not sure that's the most serious difficulty. But you want to go on to that? Um yeah, part of your theory was based on a stably trapped limit uh, of energetic electrons inside the plasma sphere. Right? That's right. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't believe that the concept of a stably trapped limit applies within the plasma sphere because if it did, there wouldn't be a slot in energetic electrons. Uh, well, there's been a lot of, well, there's been various papers published assuming that 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 the uh, electrons are quite often near the uh, upper flux limit within the plasma sphere. Uh, I haven't seen any. Well, well, for example, um, Bryce and Lucas in 1971. And L values like three or four or something? Are you talking about L values of six or seven? Well, I don't think they were um, at too large or L values. The, the whole concept of having a slot where the flux, fluxes go to zero is completely inconsistent with the concept of a stably trapped limit within the plasma sphere. The, the the slot actually is is, is applying to much larger uh, energy. The, the, it's much larger energetic electrons than we were considering here. Uh, the slot is MeV electrons, whereas we're more or less considering down to 100 kV electrons. And the ducts are generally within the plasma sphere, like between L equals two and three and such. Ducts or well, ducts are mainly observed between three and four. Okay, well that's still in the middle of the slot. 
or uh, even well, 100 kV electrons, 200 kV electrons. Well, and the uh, lower energy electrons don't interact with the energies of particles that are lower than that. Rich Beth, um, people don't seem to like your theory, but could I ask if there's any alternative theory that's um, um, better? <laughs> well, well, I'm liable to run into very big trouble with the Stanford crowd if I if, if I said that their th thundercloud theory was no good. But <laughs> you, you know, that's that is the only real theory that 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 has been fully developed that, that, that opposes our theory. Obviously our, our theory just may be one of a number of theories that may work. This theory doesn't work outside the plasma sphere as the plasma density gradient goes as L to the negative 4 there and uh, consequently the mechanism won't work. As there are suggestions though that just adding energy to the plasma can enhance the, the far off history of remember it's in 2, which is a much more simple concept I think. Look, I think that uh, I, we've over, I've overstepped trying to lot into this session, and I think I'd better um, withdraw and get on with the next few things.